you take your Bible and turn over to the book of 1 Peter and go to chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. As you're turning over there, let me just remind you without going back and, and looking at this again, we really began in chapter 2 with this idea of submission. And you remember the Christian is to be submissive to the government, the master uh, or the uh, slave submissive to his master, the wife submissive to the husband, and even the husband. And Jim, you can come down on that main just a little bit. I hear a little, little bit of feedback coming on there, and that'll help just a little bit. There you go. And tonight, we're going to move, in, starting with verse 8, to really what I think is an exhortation to the whole church. And so he's speaking to these individual groups. Not that the earlier exhortation when he said be uh, submissive to the government is certainly not for the Christian. But specifically in verse 8, it seems to be as he's turned now and talked about the responsibility that we have as a church. And if you look at verse 8, you'll notice he says, Finally, finally be ye all of one mind. Now, if you ever have become irritated before when a preacher gets up and says, finally now, and then goes on for another 15 or 20 minutes, well, we got Bible for doing that, all right? So uh, don't, don't hold it against us. Uh, Paul does that all the time. You know, finally, and he has two or three more chapters after he says that. So finally, be ye all of one mind. Now, there's probably nothing more important in a church than that very thing to be ye all of one mind. If you want to know what will set a church apart from other churches, it is if that church is of one mind. In fact, it shouldn't be the case. But if you go into a church that is unified, that is together, that uh, has things in common, it, that ought to be commonplace, but it's actually not. I've been to a lot of churches. And I've been to some that were, some were not. And I'm telling you, a church that is not unified is not going to make much progress. Because God has exhorted us, not just here, but He's exhorted us to be of one mind. You know, I go back to the book of Acts, and I, I know that God recorded that history for us because we saw the church in its infant state. We saw the church at a time when there was more evident power from the Spirit of God than ever there would be again in church history. Though there have been visitations along the way, the book of Acts was the most impacting time the church reached thousands of people in a short period of time and really it wasn't men it was the Holy Spirit of God who had came, come in and these men went with the message of resurrection and now 2,000 years later we are still impacted by the seeds that were sown during those times during the book of Acts. And you know what you find in the book of Acts is you find a church that had all things in common. You find a church that it says they were steadfast in the apostles doctrine in fellowship in breaking of bread and in prayer. You go over to chapter 4, you remember uh, we're impacted by the story of Ananias and Sapphira. But you know what led to that was the fact that the church was so common and there was so much persecution going against the church. Uh, Jews, of course, were the specifically what were being uh, talked about there. They had, they had uh, reached a state of poverty in many cases. Um, their families had disowned them. Uh, the government was opposed to them. Nobody would hire them. There was no way they could make a living. And there were some of the Christians who actually had independent wealth. And they looked at these other Christians and they said, well, what's mine is God's. And if they need help, we're going to help them. And they had all things in common to the point that Barnabas sold a piece of his land. And he said, look, I've got this land. It's worth money. He sold it and he laid it at the apostles' feet. And that was how together they were and how interested they were in one another. Now, I'm not uh, advocating that we start uh, communism. That's not the point. But the fact is, in their mind, in their thinking, it wasn't a one person, a one man show. It was unified. Now he says, brethren, be ye all of one mind. Now I think in these next verses, certainly in the earlier ones, he gives us some thought as to how that's going to be accomplished. Now, we live in a world, and of course he's, he's told the Christian, respond to the world with submission. You slaves, respond to your masters with submission. You wives, respond with submissions. And husbands, you're responsible to the point that your prayers could be hindered. And so church, how are you going to respond compared to the world. Well, how does the world respond? The world responds, if you do me wrong, I'm going to do you wrong. That's how the world responds. Well, notice now in verse 8, if I'm going to be of one mind, the first thing it's going to take is pity. Now, it says, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, 
Be pitiful, be courteous. Now, there's some practical advice, isn't it? You know, just common compassion. You know, there are unsaved people who sometimes show compassion. Wouldn't it be tragic if the world was ever better at that than believers are? And sometimes they are. And that shouldn't be the case. Sometimes you'll find an unsaved neighbor who's shown more compassion or help than somebody who claims to be a Christian. But especially, not just to the world, but especially what he's saying here is to one another. You know, a Christian ought to know, and that certainly causes unity in the church. And I think that God has given us a spirit of unity. I don't take it for granted. I don't believe we've arrived. I think the exhortation is for us. But I do look sometimes, and I think one of the things that helps us in the matter of unity is folks are compassionate with one another. Now, I'll tell you, it thrills me when I find out somebody's been sick and somebody besides me has called them, somebody sent them a card, Somebody's find out how they're doing. Uh, they feel like, hey, I'm not forgotten here. Somebody knows about me. Somebody knows I'm still here. Um, that's showing compassion. That's being pitiful. That's showing love like uh, they're not just part of my social club. They're part of my family. Amen. And that's what causes unity. So first of all, there's pity. Well, then I notice also if the church is going to be unified, there's got to be peace. It says in verse 10, For he that will love life and see good days... Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Now, uh, the world responds with revenge. In fact, verse 9, not rendering evil for evil. The world does that. The world seeks revenge. They seek to be, uh, uh, you're not going to get one up on me. The church seeks peace. How can I make peace with my neighbor? Now, there's some people that are, you almost never can uh, bury the hatchet with. There are some folks you feel like if I buried the hatchet, or if, I, if we buried the hatchet, somehow it's going to get buried in top of my head. I understand that. I mean, some folks you have to... You know, the Bible even says to seek peace with people as far as is possible. As far as it lieth in you, seek peace with all men. There are some people it's very difficult to seek peace in. But when it comes to the church... We ought to not see how we can get up on one another, but to find places of commonality and say, how can we get along with one another? I mean, here we find that he's saying not rendering evil for evil, but if you want to uh, see love life and see good days, first of all, you refrain that tongue from evil. And his tongue that he speak no guile. Refrain your lips, hold your tongue. What is the biggest problem of disunity in a church when it comes down to it? Your tongue. I mean, you remove that one obstacle from most churches, and that would solve a good bit of the problem. Because much of it is speech. You know, there was some guy years ago, I don't know who he was, all I know is he hadn't been around much. And he said this, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. What idiot came up with that? I mean, words can do far more harm to you than sticks and stones. You can heal up from a stick and a stone. Broken bone, a bruise, you get over that. But there's words that the Bible says go down to the innermost part of the belly and cause problems that will never be brought out. I mean, there are people who have hold, held on to stuff that was simply said to them. They have held it on for years and years and years. And that is something that God says if you want to seek peace, then refrain that tongue. And so that he, he says that's how it'll take. So we've got to have uh, compassion or pity on one another. There's got to be peace. And then look at verse 12. It says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, certainly if a church is going to be unified and therefore powerful, and therefore able to move forward in the gospel, and able to be effective in the community, what more resource do we have than prayer? You know, prayer is a unifying element. In a way, you think about that, we have corporate prayer. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. And he says, if two of you shall agree on earth, earth as touching anything, uh, it shall be done of my Father which is in heaven. Now, that doesn't mean just because two people get together and say, you know, we sure would like this to take place. You know, let's pray about this together that God says you can count on an answer. But he's saying if two of you as touching anything, 
The idea behind it is God has burdened two different people about the same thing because who did the burdening? The Holy Spirit of God. He's burdened him. He's burdened him. He says what that is telling you is God wants to do something and all you got to do is ask. You know, the only way that really happens is if we listen to him, isn't it? I mean, if, we're, if everything's so loud and clouded, we can't hear the Spirit of God speak. Uh, even if he did speak to two of us and we weren't listening, we may miss out on what God wants to do. But he says, if two of you agree as touching anything, God's burdened you both. He's made this clear. He's moving forward. We can pray. You know, prayer is not just an exercise. I mean, it is not just, we ought to come in tonight because, honestly, you listen to the world talk about prayer. How do, what, what is their opinion of it? If you listen carefully, what they think is, is if we were to come together tonight, for instance, like this. Let's say a big tragic event took place, and I'm uptight about it, and I'm bothered, and I don't know how it's going to turn out. We've been attacked by a terrorist, or an airplane has crashed, or there's just been this terrible uh, uh, hurricane that's come through, and, and, and we need to get together in a church, and we need to pray. Well, that sounds good, and they do need to pray. But what do they mean by it? The prayer will make us feel calm and peaceful. And it's sort of an exercise. We just kind of get together. There's really no thought about the fact of who they're praying to. That's the significance of prayer, is who you're asking. And yes, to get together and to pray and to come together, of course, many times to them, when they come together, you can come together with whoever, you know, whether you know God or not. And let's just all gather in a room and say something because it's a calming effect. You know, at first... Thought you thought, well, man, that is calming. Well, it's not calming unless we know the person to whom we're praying has power to do something about it and wants to do something about it and, and can, has the power to accomplish it. Now, that's the world. But let's think about the church. The church has the ability to pray. Now, who is the church? The church is believers. People that are born again are part of the church. And it says, and he uses the corporate here, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. Now, there's plenty of prayer promises in the Bible to the individual. Unto him who is able to do exceedingly above all that we ask or think. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Um, ask, I have not because ye ask not. Um, there are things in the Bible that I could look at and say that's a personal promise. But now he's talking about the righteous. Well, now, there's many promises in the Bible to the righteous, especially in the book of Psalms. You go to the book of Psalms, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Um, his, I, I, and this is a quote, really, from the Psalms about his eyes being over the righteous. Who are the righteous? Well, in the Old Testament, a person who simply looked at the law and said, well, a person that's righteous is a person that meets their obligation. Because that's really what righteousness means. God has a standard, and if you meet that standard, you're righteous. You've met your obligation. You're just. But the fact is, in the Old Testament, if a person tried to keep God's law, or if you tried to keep it now, and you try to attain righteousness that way, you're not going to be able to attain it. There is no righteousness in your own works. Righteousness comes through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I go to God and I pray, if our church says, well, you know, we can meet together... And we can pray because, after all, um, we're a holy church. And we, you know, just don't have any imperfect people in our church. And we just don't have any problems. And our testimony is impeccable. Um, well, if we had a church like that, we sure wouldn't want any more members. Because we wouldn't want anybody to mess it up. We want to make sure we kept it right, okay? Uh, our church isn't righteous because we've got an impeccable testimony. Now, we ought to strive to have one. The church is righteous because it's made up of born-again People who have been made righteous in the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that prayer that I make today is a prayer based on the work of Christ. You say, oh, but this person over here, he's a godly believer and he uh, really lives right. Now, godly believers who live right often are, are better prayer warriors, but it's not because they've earned God's favor. It's not because, oh, God, this person reads their Bible every day, witnesses, tries to live a holy life and doesn't do wrong. I'm going to listen to him. But this person over here still got a ways to go. I'm not going to listen. That's not what it's based on. He has not dealt with us after our sin nor rewarded us according to our iniquity. It's not based on works. Now, why is it that the godly person sometimes gets their prayers answered more? 
Well, first of all, they pray more. Okay? Second of all, they're listening to God a little more attentively. They're listening to the book and paying attention to the promises of God. And it's based on, again, faith. And faith is, is built because they're listening and they're not hindered. The second part of the verse also answers the question. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, as a Christian, I would hate to think that God's face was ever against me. I mean, this is a, a quote from the Old Testament. And, of course, it's showing a distinction between those that are lost and those that are saved. But there is a principle there that's quoted in the Psalms, of course, is that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It's not that I've earned God's favor by doing good, but certainly I could hinder the flow of blessing when I don't obey Him and I don't deal with it. So the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now think about it. What could a church do if they became unified in prayer and determined they wanted to do what God had already decreed He wanted done? You think it would be that difficult to get it done? I mean, if God... Now listen up. Listen to the preaching. If, if God wants to do it, and we're uh, praying for it in a corporate way, don't you think we ought to be able to get it done? I mean, God's already behind it, just waiting for us to ask. And so God can uh, minister to us. If we want to be unified, we ought to learn how to pray. Now, that's not just on prayer meeting. That's it just because we're talking corporately. Uh, we can leave tonight. And we can go home and pray about things in a corporate way. Now, not only do we need prayer, we need protection. Look at verse 13. Who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Now, the church certainly ought to have within us, we, you know, we pity, we have compassion, we learn how to pray, we have peace. But what about from an outward standpoint? We've got protection. Who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? That sounds a whole lot like Romans 8.31. If God be for us, who can be against us? That sounds a whole lot like what Bob Jones Sr. said, which he got from the principles of the Bible. You and God make a majority in any community. I mean, you think about that. If God be for us, who can be against us? The church is a protected entity. Now, believers are part of the church. So nothing will ever happen bad to a church. No, God didn't promise that. But within the midst of the circumstances, God says, you're within my protection. You know, it, it's really, you know, uh, lost people used to be a little bit more afraid of a church, didn't they? Of course, they are afraid of the building. They, you know, I'd go uh, rob a gas station and rob a quick stop, but I'm not going to vandalize a church. I mean, God might, you know, curse you if you do that. Well, the church is just the building. But there's a reason they believe that. You know where that became ingrained in their heart? Because in years past, people knew you don't mess with God's people. Amen. You mess with God's people, and God's going to take care of them. And that's always been true. And the closer we walk with God, the more that's going to be the case, God's going to protect. So we need protection. Um, then you notice in verse 14 how we respond to persecution. It says, But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But here's how you respond. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Now, the church needs preparation. We need to be prepared to do exactly what he said to do here. To be ready to give an answer. Now, I, there are people who have advocated um, what we call lifestyle evangelism. There are people who have advocated what we would call confrontational evangelism. Do you know the difference in those two? One of them says, you live your life in such a way, such an outstanding testimony, you know, try to respond right, have a, a holy life, and be faithful, and the world is going to notice that. How many people believe you'll notice it if you live right? If the, the world's going to notice it, right? They're going to see it, sure. All right, they say, now, if you live like that, the world will notice it, and eventually somebody is going to come to you and say... How, what makes you different? You've got something I don't have. Now, isn't there an implication in verse 15 that somebody's going to ask you a question? Be ready to give an answer for those that ask you. So that's, that would be the thought behind lifestyle evangelism. Confrontation evangelism says people are lost. They're not inherently anxious to find out anything good. 
And so we've got to step into their world and say, by the way, do you know that you have a need and that need is Jesus? We need to confront them with the gospel and the confrontational evangelist says the way to reach people is you just confront them where they are and tell them about Jesus. Now let me tell you, let me straighten you out. These, these two sides, I'll tell you, if they just listen to me, I could straighten them out, right? Okay. Is the truth one or the other? It's both. Hey, both are involved. My testimony accents my confrontation tremendously. And apart from confrontation, there are very few people who are ever going to come and ask you what the difference is. But let me tell you what will make them ask the question. Because I'm going right here. This is the passage that says, if they ask you, here's your answer. Do you know what, it's called, what causes it? Is how you respond to trials. How you respond to difficulties. There is nothing that would give you more open doors for witnessing than to respond well to a difficulty. You know, uh, if you don't tell dirty jokes when everybody else at the job tells dirty jokes, people will notice it. But I don't know that they're going to come to you and say, I am so impressed with how you walk away every time a dirty joke is. I'd just like you to tell me what makes you different. That could happen, but not a lot. Okay, uh, If you go to church every Sunday, you, people will notice it. But I don't know that your neighbors are going to come over and say, I get under conviction every time you go to church, and I really want to know what makes you different. Probably that's, I mean, I'm not saying it never would, but not on a, a, a lot. But what if you went through a deep trial? People knew you were struggling. They knew maybe you're being persecuted openly, or maybe it's just a, a physical problem you have, and you go through it. Yes, you're hurting. Yes, maybe physically, maybe emotionally, whatever. You're, it's difficult, but you have a smile on your face. You approach it with the grace of God. When they ask you how you're doing, I, well, yeah, I admit it's difficult, but God's, God's good. That, somebody's going to come to you eventually and say, how do you do it? Amen. You know why they're going to ask you that? Because they, they knew they couldn't do it. They're, and you've heard that statement even from unsafe people. I don't know how they do it. I couldn't handle it. Well, you couldn't handle it. The grace of God is the only reason you can handle it. And do you realize now, so whatever trial I go through, might be the greatest open door I have for somebody to ask me that very question. The hope that lieth within you. So my greatest testimony evidently to a lost world is what? Hope. Because they're hopeless. Now, he says when they ask, we ought to be ready to answer. You know, if a church is what it ought to be, we ought to be a prepared church. You know, if we don't really know much about this book and they come and ask me, what am I going to tell them? I got to be prepared. I got to be ready to give an answer. Where, where is my hope lie? Say, well, you know, preacher, I've never been to Bible college. Uh, preacher, I've never really uh, taken a course on this type of thing. I'm not, my memory's not that good. I don't know the Bible that well, but where is your hope lie? If your hope is in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, then you've got an answer to be able to give them, don't you? That's where my hope lies. And so the church is to be of one mind. It can be of one mind because God has shown us how we can do that. To love one another as brethren, to respond well, keep control of those words that cause uh, uh, problems, and then to understand that God's protected us and be prepared to tell people why. And God can use our church and use the, the church of God as far as that's concerned as a result of that. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer tonight. Lord, how we thank you tonight for your word. We just pray tonight that you would give us a spirit of unity, a spirit of trust in you, a claim of your promise, and that, Lord, you would help us to stay faithful to you, to be the testimony we ought to be. Lord, we trust tonight that even in this service, our hearts will be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we're going to stand, stand, sing a song tonight. 468 will be our closing song. As we stand and sing 468, we finish singing that, we'll be dismissed.